Good evening, everybody. If we could stand tonight. And it feels good to be in the house of the Lord. There's a sweet presence tonight. I'm thankful to be here, and uh, I'm thankful for the turnout we had Monday night at the Minister's Bake. We, we had some great food. I, I talked to one gentleman, him and his wife moved here, and he said, y'all certainly know how to eat here. That is one thing y'all know how to do. Y'all know how to eat. Y'all have some good food, and I'm thankful for all the women that cooked. It was excellent. I'm grateful that it's the best time of the year. It's the best time. It, it's cold. It makes the coffee taste better. It's just a good time. It is a good time of the year. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful for the Lord. I'm, I'm thankful for what He's doing. It's good to be here. Can we just clap our hands tonight unto the Lord? Aren't you grateful to be in His presence? There's truly no better place to be in His presence. There is fullness of joy. I'm so thankful that uh, I'm thankful for the Word. I'm, I'm thankful for the Holy Ghost. I'm thankful for when my, I'm overwhelmed, the Holy Ghost just invites me to go to the above. He just invites me to go above all the problems. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. He, he's for us. He is for us. I'm, I'm thankful for the growth. There's a lot of good things going on. The Lord's doing mighty things. I, I'm thankful for recovery. Uh, Sunday we had a great move of God. It's just a blessing. It's a great time to serve Jesus Christ. The world's hungry. We're going to go into prayer tonight. And uh, I know there's a lot of things we need to pray for. I've got things I need to pray for. Family members, sickness. Um, and I know there's a lot of that, but something, the Lord's just been doing something to me in prayer lately, and uh, it was mentioned at the minister's banquet about putting feet with your prayer, feet with your faith, and I can't stay the same when I come into prayer, and Pastor talked about it with growth last week, the more we look like Christ, the more the body will look like Christ, and something that I want to pray about tonight is, this isn't just another Wednesday night. We need everything we can get out of what pastor's going to say tonight. I, I want to pray we get our hearts in the right place to grow. We, I want to pray that we get our hearts in the right places in our circumstance to, to, to go to the above. And I also believe the Lord's going to touch some people tonight. I believe He's going to touch some situations. But as we, go to the, as we go to the Lord tonight in prayer, if you need something, why don't you just raise your hand and call upon Him tonight. Lord, I love you. I'm grateful for what I feel in this place. Lord, I'm grateful for your presence. Lord, when your presence is here, nothing can stay the same. Lord, I pray that you search us tonight. Lord, you begin to stir up the fallow ground of our heart that we may receive what you want to do tonight. God, I'm speaking it tonight, Lord, that you have a word for us, that you're moving in our lives, you're moving in our homes, you're moving in our family. God, I pray that you touch our minds, renew our minds tonight. Lord, I pray that the distractions and everything we dealt with, with the monotony of the day today, Lord, help us to be in the moment tonight. Lord, help us to get everything we need. And Lord, I pray that in the mighty name of Jesus, you touch every sickness, spiritual, physical, and emotional. And I speak healing tonight. Lord, I pray for situations to turn around. I pray for faith to rise up in homes. And Lord, I pray that we just find a joy in your presence tonight. God, I pray that there is a joy that rises up in every circumstance. And I pray this in Jesus' name.
anybody astounded by his mercy tonight? Come on, has he shown you mercy when you didn't deserve it? Hallelujah. I'm just astounded by Christ our Savior. He did what I couldn't do. But he died for us when we, when we were still yet sinners. You can be seated if you like. I was talking with Brother Cody the other day. I, I told him, we, you know, we working through the steps. And I said, the closer I get to Christ, the more stuff I work out, Brother Shannon, the more I realize I'm kind of messed up. I need him more. The closer I get to the cross, the more dependent I get upon him, Brother Christian. The, the, the more stuff I work out, the more humble I get. And I recognize the work that he did when I got baptized. I, I recognize the work that he did when I got the Holy Ghost. Christ our Savior, there's none like him. Nobody like Jesus. Nobody like my God. Amen. We're going to go into giving tonight. We have Giveify, PayPal available at riverbendpentecostals.com. Cash and checks can be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. And we have pans for tithing here. And on the outside, we have pans for offering. And you can also text to give at 833-883-9311. If you're excited to give, will you stand with me tonight? I'm giving out of a cheerful heart tonight. Never one time have I felt like I had to do this. I get to do this. I get to give back to the Lord. I, he's been good to me. He's been faithful to me. And it's nothing for me to give Him my all. It's nothing to give Him what He already deserves. It's nothing to give Him my worship. It's nothing to give Him my time. If you have some faith tonight, will you pray with me? Upon the authority of your word, I have given. And it shall be given unto me. Press down, shaking together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken, and I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished, royalties received, my whole family saved in serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in and I am blessed going out and all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen.
Come on, we just need to clap our hands to the Lord right now. Come on, he's in this place. Come on, we can't get comfortable right now. God can do anything right now. Hallelujah. He's awesome. Sometimes I don't even think I grasp, I can even grasp how big he really is, Brother Shane. And I'm just thankful to know him. I'm just hungry to know Jesus tonight. I'm really just, that's why I'm here. I just want to know Jesus Christ. And I need a deeper revelation of him. I need more of him. I need more than a good idea. I need more than what the world says about Jesus. I, I, I need to know who he is. Amen. You can be seated if you'd like. And Riverbend kids can come forward. I'm also thankful for our praise team. We got an amazing praise team. Amazing, anointed. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful they allow the Lord to work through them. And I'm grateful for the children. And Our children are hungry. Our children are very, very hungry for the Lord. Um, not too long ago, I was at the New Madrid Middle School and teaching there. There was kids there, Brother Shannon. I'm talking little kids. What about speaking in tongues? There was one kid that asked me, what about being born again? Didn't plan it. Didn't plan on talking about those things. But I'm just so thankful that the Lord has drawn everybody Every age, it does not matter. We serve a big God and He's doing big things. And we're going to pray over these children tonight because He's working in their lives. If you believe that, why don't you stretch your hands forward tonight. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I'm praying, Lord, and I'm believing that You have a plan for their life. God, I pray that You anoint the teachers back there tonight and I pray that the words that come forth are straight from You. Lord, I, I pray that our children get a word from You tonight and that they hold on to it. Lord, I I pray that there's something that will touch their hearts that will stir up a deeper relationship with you, God. Lord, I pray that you protect their minds, their steps, and wherever they go, Lord, I just pray that your protection is upon them. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. If you want to lead them back, Kai, you can go on. You can head them back, buddy. And uh, Riverbend Ignited can come forward. Awesome, awesome. We had a great crowd tonight. Kids, amen. I'm thankful for our youth. I'm looking forward to what the Lord's going to do in their life and how He's going to use them. And we need to be praying for them. There's a lot that comes at their minds. But we're going to pray over their relationship with the Lord tonight and that He protects them. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm grateful for our youth, and Lord, I'm grateful for their hunger for you. I'm grateful, Lord, that they, week after week they show up. They may not feel like it. They may be going through some things, but Lord, I'm grateful for their faith. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that you bless that faith, Lord. I, I pray that you bless them when they talk to you. I pray that you bless them when they get in your word. Lord, I pray that they get revelation. Lord, I, I pray that they get relationship in a prayer room. Lord, I pray that there's something inside of them that we get hungry for you. But Lord, I pray that you protect their minds. Lord, what they're allowing into their eyes, into their ears. Lord, I, I pray for godly influence to rule in their life, Lord. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. If you want to lead them on back. And we're going to turn it over to Pastor. Are you excited about the Word of God tonight? If you are, clap your hands. Hallelujah. I hope you are. Amen. Look ready or not. Here it comes. Amen. We're going to go to the Word of the Lord. Good to see everybody. I echo Brother Blake's statements. We had the Section 4 Ministers Banquet here Monday night, and, and the food was incredible. The decorations were wonderful. The attendance was good. We did have some sickness that struck us, but we had, at the beginning had 70, 75 people had committed to come to it, and we ended up with only in the middle 60s, but by 63, 64 because of sickness and what have you, but it was it was beautiful and incredible, and uh, I've been thinking about it, to tell you the truth, a little bit 
sense to me. Uh, right that minute, you know you don't want to take home no leftovers. Because you just like stuff, but now I wish I had a We uh, don't cut out of here too early and run because uh, we're going to baptize Lindsay. Wave your hand, Lindsay. Wave at us, Lindsay. Lindsay wants to be baptized in Jesus' name before we leave here tonight. So uh, don't don't cut and run too early. And uh, I'm, I'm long for the day when you show up just knowing somebody's going to get baptized or somebody's going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Somebody's going to be healed, delivered. Amen? Amen. Do you believe it? Yes. That's what the book says. That's what the book says. So I uh, hope we have enough handouts for tonight. Uh, it's good to see everybody here. Our congregation does look good. I'm happy to tell you that last week, uh, I don't do this every week. I don't do it all the time, and I won't do it all the time. But last week, we took our Sunday attendance, and then we took those that came Wednesday that weren't here on Sunday. Then we took those that were at Parma on Tuesday that weren't here on Sunday or Wednesday. And then those that were here Thursday night that had not been here previously. You follow me? And there were 184 people that traveled through the river bend last week. That were to 184 unique individuals that were here at least one time uh, in the ministry of the river bend. That's exciting. Yes. Amen. Isn't that exciting? Yes. <coughs> Our series is growth, which is creation, which we went over last week. If you remember, you had about an eight-page handout. At least that's how everybody acted toward me. And uh, But we talked about your creative purpose. And I wanna, the one thing that I want to stress is your creative purpose hasn't changed. God's plan for you, I would argue that everything you've been through, he's going to use it to complete his purpose. And uh, I, uh, I encourage you that this has nothing to do with my ego. Because y'all understand, I get paid the same whether you get anything or not. Okay? I don't get no bonus for the more people that get something out of Bible study. But I can tell you right now, you've got to get something out of it. Yes. Your eternity depends on it. Yes. Your future depends on it. I, 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 I'm not going to, I'm nobody's judge, but uh, I, I, th I think whether you make it depends on it. I think it. Matter of fact, I know it. Because the Bible says he chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. That's not, Brother David, just your initial time hearing the word. Because that was written to the church. The Corinthian church. So this is important. And I'm going to stress it. I'm going to stress it. I hear people say Bible study is boring to them. All right? I can't help that. I can't, I can't help it. If you think it's boring, I can't help it. All right? I, I can't help it. I do everything I can to make it exciting. I lose my mind. I spit. I slobber. I holler. I yell. I cry. I snort. I study. I plan. I give out handouts. I, I don't know what else to do. Okay? I, I work really hard to not be boring. But I, I, I think people still say that Bible study is boring. But, and, and, and people say sometimes I don't get anything out of it. That ain't my fault. I mean, really, 
Matter of fact, Brother Shannon, guess what? Ain't my job to see if you get anything out of it right. or not. It's not my job. But I am telling you, we have got to become a word church, not a feeling church. Feeling doesn't save you. The word does. Feeling won't keep you. How many can testify that you felt the power of the Holy Ghost on a Sunday, but by about Tuesday afternoon, you even wondered if you had anything or not? Feeling won't keep you, but the word will. We have got, and, and what we're teaching, we have got to glean something. You don't have to get it all. All right, but we got to want it all. We do. We have to. Now, personally, Wednesday night's probably my favorite service. I love Wednesday nights. And I love teaching. I love being taught to. I really like, I, well, on Wednesday, Wednesday's my favorite. On Sunday, Sunday's my favorite. On Thursday? Yeah. Yeah, don't let me get carried away because some of these folks don't know what we'd be talking about when I said on Thursday because they ain't never come because they don't think they need it. Surprise. I, I started going to recovery because Pastor wanted to support it. I wasn't there... 10 minutes till I realized Pastor needed recovery. Amen. Now, if that makes you want to fire me, we'll just get you a little crew together. But I bet you my group's bigger than yours. What you on the bet? It appears we're talking about formation tonight. Growth is a process from creation to formation to completion. Creation is how you got here. In our in our, our universe right now, creation took place in Egypt. Formation takes place in the wilderness. And fulfillment is the promised land. Y'all with me on that, right? We've, we've, we've got into that deep enough. So it appears throughout the Bible, both before Egypt and after, that the wilderness experience is essential for us ending up and going to where God would have us to go and becoming what God would have us to be. The wilderness experience, wilderness that you see from the root word is wild, and it is a basically an untamed place, isolated, uninhabited, wild. Okay? It is not refined. It is not, you know, proper. It is, you know, you, you, John the Baptist probably testifies of the wilderness as good as anybody, Brother Jerry, when it said he come out of the wilderness dressed in camel hair, eating locust and wild honey. Y'all picture this wild man. You know, Ishmael was a man of the wilderness. Elijah was a man of the wilderness. And, and you kind of get, you kind of get, excuse the carnal reference, but you kind of get the Grizzly Adams picture. Right? Coming out of the wilderness, okay? So it appears that spiritually speaking, the wilderness experience is essential for going where God would have us to go and becoming what God would have us to be. We see that Abraham had a wilderness experience. Can anybody tell me when Abraham had his wilderness experience? How about when he let Lot choose which way you want to go? And Lot chose the well-watered plains of Jordan. And what did he leave Abraham with? The wilderness. He left him with the sandy place. He left him with the desert. And all the Lord did was use the sand as an illustration of how he was going to bless him, right? It was what Abraham had left when Lot chose the well-watered plain of Jordan. And it was in that wilderness that the Lord began to speak to Abraham and tell him what he was going to do in his life. Moses had his wilderness experience. It was where he ran after jumping the gun and trying to be a deliverer before he was ready to be a deliverer. Implementing his righteousness rather than waiting on God's timeline and God's righteousness. And Moses leaves Pharaoh's house and literally spends 40 years on the backside of the wilderness, the backside of the desert, 
which is literally means even in a little bit worse spot than what you might would see. David had his wilderness experience. When on the run from Saul, he was discredited, he was falsely accused and maligned, struggled to survive in caves, and even sought and found refuge among the enemy of his land and his people, and he was anointed the whole time. Right? Matter of fact, until David got anointed, he became, when he got anointed, he became a giant killer. But when it came time for him to start moving into his place, Brother David, he had to go to the wilderness. Elijah had at least two wilderness experiences, the Bible tells us of. He was sent by God into a wilderness in the middle of a three-plus-year drought and famine, camping beside a brook where he was fed by ravens. It was there he was given direction to get up and go to Zarephath, and it was there that the Lord began to lead him into his ministry. But after a victorious encounter on top of Mount Carmel and a subsequent threat made by Jezebel, which was, tomorrow you're dead, buddy. Elijah ran to the wilderness. He ran to an isolated place and hid in a cave where he prayed to die. And it was there that the Lord said, what are you doing here? Jesus had his wilderness experiences. First, he was there alone, Matthew chapter number 4, and he fasted for 40 days, at the end of which he, the Spirit took him to the wilderness. And he endured a period of temptation designed to derail him from his purpose. I said designed to derail him from his purpose. I'm going to just interject this because I feel it the Spirit, and I may say it more. Some of y'all are going to connect way more with what I'm teaching right now than you are comfortable to admit. You are in the wilderness, but God is speaking to you and God is directing you. Don't be distracted by the sand. Don't be distracted by the wind. Don't be distracted by the loneliness or the isolation. And sure enough, don't be distracted by others that are not in the wilderness. Just because they're not in the wilderness with you right now doesn't mean that they haven't been there or that they're not going there. But God's work, God is working in your life. And he's trying to bring you to a place of completion because he has ministry, he has calling, he has gifting, he has ready for your ministry. And you're where you are because God needs you to be there. Jesus is 40 days fasting and then he goes to the wilderness to be tempted or tested of the devil. The devil tried, if you're the son of God, he attacked at his morale when his body was weak. Can, I, can somebody say amen? amen? It was the fulfillment of that purpose that he would not be swayed from that led him to perhaps his greatest wilderness struggle. It began in the Garden of Gethsemane. When Brother Blake, the closer he got to the cross, the more alone he found himself. The more abandoned, the more isolated, the more wild the terrain became. Although he never did leave his hometown, never did leave his home area in order to be taken, beaten, in prison, and crucified, he most definitely went to the wilderness. Beginning at the garden all the way up to laying in a borrowed tomb. Jesus had his wilderness experiences. Paul had a wilderness experience. You should have read it in the bread in the last couple of weeks. He said, right after I caught the Holy Ghost, I didn't confer with flesh and blood. But he said, anybody read that? I went to Arabia for three years. He said, I saw none of the disciples or none of the apostles Except after that three-year period, I spent 15 days with Peter because he was letting the Galatian church know he received some things in a lonely place, yeah. in an isolated place, in a wilderness, as it were. And it was there that he received the complete revelation of the truth of the gospel. You find that in Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 through 18. In keeping with the pattern of our series, Egypt was the place of creation. It's where they became a people. It was the incubator for 70 to become 3 to 5 million people over 400 years. I, I said this in our holiness series, 
But has it ever occurred to you that they were in Egypt longer than the United States has even been a country? Over 400 years. We've only been a country for some 200 some odd years. About almost 250 years. Egypt was a place of creation. And their subsequent 40 plus year wilderness journey was the place where they became what God needed them to be in order to go to the promised land. Preparing them for fulfillment. And those that survived the wilderness experience, and I do want, I'm going to say this later, but I'm going to say it right now. Some people never make it out of the wilderness. But these people were created to possess the promised land. You were created for fulfillment. Let's talk about the fall of man. It's, of course, well known as when the desires of the flesh overwhelmed and drowned out the Word of God. Simply that. The desires of the flesh overwhelmed and drowned out the Word of God. Adam and Eve disobeyed God's Word, and they thereby brought sin into the world, and man was separated from God. And he began to miss out on everything he was created to do. In Exodus, the book of Exodus, as well as the story of the Exodus, we see the evidence of the supernatural power of God delivering his people out of bondage. Everybody say bondage. bondage. Get familiar with it. Because you're either there or you've been delivered from it. Everybody has a bondage they have to be brought out of. That's an experience that will have to be shared universally. Everyone has a bondage from which they need to be delivered. The Lord gave me this to say to you. If you're thinking right now, I've never had anything to be delivered from. There ain't nothing ever had me in bondage. You're still there. I said, you're still there. You really, oh, Holy Ghost, help me right now. Jesus Christ spoke to the Pharisees, and he told them that they had been in bondage. And they said, we've never been in bondage to any man. And they forgot their 400 years slavery in Egypt. Let me tell you something. The devil don't want you to know what the wilderness can do for you. The devil does not want you to know what your struggle can do for you. He is going to join in with you in either saying, this ain't worth it, or I don't have no problems. Let me tell you something. I am more worried when I pray over these, when I pray over these lessons, and when I study these lessons, I am more grieved and I have a greater burden for those that don't think they need it. I am not wet behind the ears no more. I've got some corn in my crib, and I know I grew up in this church, but I've been some places, and I've been through some stuff, and I've learned some things, and I'm telling you, there is no one that the Word is touching that the Word does not mean to touch. Unfortunately, we have for far too long assumed that the greatest battle was the one coming out of Egypt. It's not. We learned in the introduction to this that the book of Hebrews tells us uh, don't be like those that came out through the blood, Brother David, came out under the cloud, under the fire, and through the water and died in the wilderness. It is not your greatest victory. Amen. Getting saved is not your greatest victory. That's right. That's right. Being filled with the Holy Ghost and born again is not your greatest victory. I know that sounds like heresy. Especially when for so many years that's all we wanted everybody to do is get the Holy Ghost. But we've had more people get the Holy Ghost and leave than we have get the Holy Ghost and stay. 
Okay. The children of Israel, after just over two years, after a miraculous 24-hour miraculous exit from Egypt, it appears between three and five million people with horses and buggies and wagons and on foot left Egypt in one night. You cannot do that without the supernatural power of God. Two years after that, they stand on the brink of entering into the promised land. And they got a glimpse of fulfillment through the eyes of 12 spies, a representative leader from each tribe. And they even partook of the reality of the promised land. Some of them got a taste. Some of them got a glimpse. And some of them got a touch. But the obstacles to the fulfillment of entering the promised land were too great for them to receive what God had for them. I want you to begin to think right now. I don't want you to be impatient. I don't want you to get pushy because the wilderness has still got to do its work. But I want you to begin to pray and ask God to reveal you. What have I missed out on because my faith wasn't strong enough? We have got to graduate we have got to move past where the dividing line is a sinner and a saint. Oh, I'm going to unpack that. I know we don't like it, but I'm going to unpack it. While well, they said the walls are too high and the people are too big, they will whoop us. Matter of fact, they saw us. They saw us, and they felt just like we did, which was stupid. Because uh, 40 some odd years later, Rahab's still talking about what the Lord did to them. She said, everybody around here is scared of you. We've been waiting on you to come. Think about that. Think about that. Don't you let somebody in your ear drown out the voice and the word of God in your life. The real obstacle was not giants and walled cities. The real obstacle was unbelief. And the rallying cry of the unbeliever is, we would have been better off staying in Egypt. The rallying cry of a lack of faith is, I was better off in the world than I am trying to live for God. This was... And is the fall of man as far as we're concerned. Unbelief makes you afraid, which makes you rebellious. It, it what is the fall of man when you stand looking at what God has for you, but you won't go in because it's going to cost you too much. You won't go in because the cities are walled or the men are too big. You understand I'm saying that figuratively. Brother Arnold said, I was watching a message Brother Arnold preached this week, and he said, the wilderness was not a place for God to learn something about them. The wilderness was all about them learning something about themselves. After they failed to trust God, and again, I am persuaded that everyone who starts out to live for God will experience a time when your faith is weak. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, I don't know if I've experienced it. Then I'm going to ask you, are you living in the land of fulfillment? Are you living in the promised land? Are you walking in your creative purpose? Did you go up and possess it when he told you? Did you go on in when he told you you could? Did you? If you did, there you go. Teach the rest of us how. I ain't arrived yet. I know I'm supposed to. I'm the pastor for goodness sakes. I ain't arrived yet. I'm on my way. The Lord's teaching me things in this Bible study. 
after the Exodus, everybody all right? After the Exodus, they were led virtually on a straight line to the brink of the promised land. And there they failed. A simple refusal to believe that God was able to do what he said he could do led them to their wilderness experience from which many of them would not return. I did not know this was in the Bible. I've read it, but I missed it. After hearing of God's displeasure with them, his conversations with Moses, the coming judgment, they repented of not going into the promised land. After the ten unbelieving spies were killed, Numbers chapter 14, verses 40 through 43 in the New Living Translation, they said, let's go. They said, we realize we have sinned, but now we are ready. Brother Larry, I can't tell you how heavy that hit me when I read that. But now we are ready. But now we are ready. That was a lie. They weren't ready. You know how we know that? He didn't let them go. Look here. We now are we ready to enter the land the Lord has promised us. They never forgot his word. His word was never in doubt. Just whether he would live up to his word was in doubt. But now they see that judgment has come on the unbelievers and that judgment has come on those with a negative report. And now all of a sudden, because they've seen judgment come to somebody else, they've decided now we're ready. But Moses said, why are you now disobeying the Lord's orders to return to the wilderness? It won't work. Do not go up into the land now. You will only be crushed by your enemies because the Lord is not with you. When you face the Amalekites and Canaanites in battle, you will be slaughtered. The Lord will abandon you because you have abandoned the Lord. The wilderness was now necessary because they weren't ready for fulfillment. They weren't ready to go in and have him. They weren't ready for him to defeat the giants and to send the hornets, he said, and empty out the promised land. They were not ready to be what God needed them to be, but they thought they were. How many times has there been something happen in your life that caused you to make an emotional commitment to God. Oh, I'm going to do it now. Oh, I'm going to fast. I'm going to fast six days a week for the next year. I'm going to pray 12 hours a day. I ain't going to sleep for the next month. Oh, I feel so moved by the Holy Ghost. Baby, you don't come out of the wilderness on your feelings. You come out of the wilderness with your face dragging the ground. The reason why they couldn't go to the promised land is because they did not know who they were. Nor, this is what this is so important, hear it. They did not have a true concept of who they were, nor had they gone to a place in their relationship with God wherein they trusted him completely. They still wanted it. They thought they had come to the necessary mindset, but God knew they didn't have what it took. Therefore, to the wilderness we must go. So why are we doing this? Why do we have to do this? Reconciliation is always the goal of God. And we cannot afford to lose sight of that. Getting you more money in the bank 
making your home happy, getting you a better job, a better truck, a better car, a better house, your kids minding, that is not the goal of God. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of people that come to church because they got yourself in a mess. Getting you out of the mess is not the goal of God. Reconciliation with God is the goal of God. Bringing you back to your creative purpose is the will of God. We cannot afford to lose sight of that. Restoring people to their creative purpose. In effect, here, I, I, I don't, again, I'm, I'm not meaning to be ugly. This is just true. There are people in this room who have been at this church for a number of years that you don't have a clue in the world what I'm talking about tonight. It's not an indictment. It's not an indictment. Thank God you're here. Thank God you're here. The will and the purpose of God is bring people back to life. The life we were created to live. There are too many Holy Ghost filled people that live every minute afraid of death. Afraid of death on your kids. Afraid of death on your life. Afraid of death on your loved one. Afraid of death on your neighbor. We live anxious, worried, and consumed with fear of death. We have got to be reconciled to life. We have got to come to a place like Paul did. I know y'all looking at me like I'm crazy, but we got to come to a place like Paul did when he said, death? Death? You're going to threaten me with death? You don't understand. I'm ready to go. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. But you know what he told him? He said, the reason I've not been gone yet is you need me. It's Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost so strong right now. He said, it's better for you that I stay here. Right. I'm ready to go. Yeah, right. I want to go. Right. But I know I got to stay here for you. I, I don't know how many ways I can say this and preach it and teach it and tell it and yell it. But you are here for somebody else. We have got to start impacting the lives in our community, on our job, in our family. Yes. Yes. How do you explain? We had 184 people move through here last week. How do you explain that three weeks ago we're now bumping a thousand views on Facebook for a regular Sunday service? Why do you think that is? Because people are hungry. Brother Cody, you'd be happy to know that Brother Ronnie got a message from somebody this week. Aaron's been gone six months. And Brother Ronnie got a message from somebody this week talking about what they felt at her funeral. Six months later, they don't, we don't even know who it is. It's just a random message. And they said, we walked out of her funeral and we looked at one another and said, I ain't never felt nothing like that in my life. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. We don't have a spirit problem. We don't have a Holy Ghost problem. We don't have a Jesus problem. We don't have a music problem. We don't have a facility problem. We've got a willingness problem. We've got a flesh problem. We have got to get something rise up in us where we lose our fear and we lose our trepidation and we've got to start believing that God will do what he said he would do. And Brother Blake is going to do it through us because the book says, now unto him that's able to do exceeding, abundantly, above all, we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. That's what this series is about. Is go win somebody. Go teach a Bible study. Go pray for somebody. Brother Terrence, we got to get to the point that I don't go get filled up with gas until I, pump, I put the pump and I don't get back in the truck and get on my phone. But I start standing around and looking. Who am I here for? 
Who am I here for? I go to Walmart because I'm all all off of the place, but I'm in the Holy Ghost right now. I go to Walmart because I need groceries, but that ain't the main reason I'm there. The main reason I'm there is the Holy Ghost is working through me. Brother Ronnie, I am persuaded that we've got to get to a place where we go to bed at night and God didn't use us and we're disappointed. And we repent and ask the Lord to forgive us for missing out because every day he wants to use us. Not the preacher, the people. It is the job of the ministry. Read it in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. It is not my job to go out and win the world. It's your job. It is my job to equip you to do it. It's my job to make you believe you can. It's in the book. He gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. That the whole body might be built up. We got to get to a place where we stop craving getting behind the pulpit or we stop craving baptizing somebody or we stop craving playing an instrument and we start craving, Lord, show me there's some soul out there. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. For getting too excited and getting too real. It is my goal as pastor. I want to see this place full. I want to see this place full. I want to build a new building. I want five campuses in southeast Missouri. But more than anything, I want to come to church every service. And somebody say, Pastor, I need to talk to you. And it ain't because you ain't got enough money to pay your light bill. And it ain't because your husband gave you the finger when he got in his truck that morning. And it ain't because the kid stuck your tongue out at you when you told him to go do the laundry. But, but you say, Pastor, let me tell you what the Lord did this week. Yeah. Let me tell you what the Lord did today. Yeah. Let me tell you what the Lord did. Because you know something, Brother Shannon? That ain't me bragging on me. That's me bragging on God. And I couldn't get to wait to get to the house of God to brag on Jesus. If I'm making you angry and making you uncomfortable, I have accomplished what I came to do. <laughs> oh, I'm fixing, to get, I'm fixing to get more right than that in just a minute. Listen to what Henry Cloud says in his book, How People Grow. Has anybody bought that book since I've been talking about it? One, two, three. Thank God for three who did. Thank God. Many times, he says, we forget the way things should be, and we forget what we're trying to accomplish in helping people grow. We focus on the wrong issues. We zero in on the problem that someone needs help with, such as depression or intimacy or addiction, as though the that problem were the main issue. Or we hammer in on a pattern of behavior we think is the sin behind the struggle. And we think that if we can get the person to be good enough for us, then we've helped them. This thinking happens not only when we help people with personal problems in the counseling arena, but also when we preach, teach, disciple, or encourage people to engage in spiritual disciplines. You know what spiritual disciplines are? <coughs> Fasting, praying, reading your Bible, giving, right? So anytime we talk about spiritual disciplines, it is things that we do in order to get our flesh discipled. Okay? When we encourage people to engage in spiritual disciplines, we speak to problems and symptoms or try various religious formulas and we miss the real life changing dynamics of this ministry of reconciliation. After all, it is far easier to focus on a particular problem in someone's life or to focus on his or her particular way of missing the mark that it is to figure out the ways that the fall of man is still operative in that 
person's life and discover a redemptive path that will reconcile his or her life. We focus on symptoms and not the root. Amen. That's nothing new. We're not going out there to help people with their problems. We're going out there to help people's life be changed back to what God created them to be in the first place. But we like messing with problems. I'm going to say this. You're not going to like it, but I'm going to say it. This is a synopsis of the curse of codependency that has held the church in bondage for many years. You don't know who you would be without trying to fix the problems of your children, of your grandchildren, of your great-grandchildren, of your nieces and your nephews and your brothers and sisters. It is bondage. You're not God. And if you came to recovery on Thursday night, you'd learn that in step number one. That came back at me. That came back at me. But I'm just going to say it again. Look up codependency. Has anybody ever looked up the definition of what codependency is? It is a damnable addiction that will cost you your soul. Without a doubt the collateral damage will be destructive. Stop bailing people out all the time. Stop trying to fix things that God's using. Stop trying to make the wilderness a paradise. Stop trying to make the whole can a mansion. And then go, oh, Lord, help me, Jesus. And then go talk about them to everybody else because they won't do right. Oh, I felt something. Y'all feel that? Huh? Let me tell you something. When they're grown and they act stupid, that is not a reflection on you. Stop making excuses for them. Stop trying to run interference for them. Because let me tell you what you're doing. I may need some armor bears. Y'all just get ready to flex it up a little bit. If you're lining up with them, you are perpetrating a lie. And it is just as damnable to be in agreement with a liar as it is to lie yourself. Did that make sense? And we dress it up and call it the work of being a Christian. I feel weak in my knees right now because this is heavy, baby. This is heavy. But the reason why many of your loved ones are not living for God is because you're still wandering around in the wandering around in the wilderness, holding up a flag that says, I'm in the promised land. Well, I didn't know I was going here tonight. But he did. Oh, and that was just the easy part. Listen to this. If simply going to the promised land was the goal, then after those ten spies are judged with death and the people recognize they sin and God's mad, we better say we're going to go because we don't want God mad at us. Brother Shannon, they were no more ready to go then than they were before. But he can't be mad at me. If they were ready to go, he would have let them go. But they weren't ready to go. Because there's more than just getting into the promised land or going into the promised land. Who they were to become when they get there and the mission they were to accomplish, they had to be ready for that. And they weren't. There is I had this typed before you spoke yesterday, by the way. There is so much more. Not less. I'm about to get right. I want y'all to hear what I'm fixing to say.
There is so much more that God has for us, not less. But there's more than just getting people to look Pentecostal. Hear me right now. We are at a place where we really can't afford for every new worshiper to line up in every area of holiness. We can't afford for it to happen. It would be a travesty. It would be a danger. It would be an emergency. You want to know why? Because when they lined up in every area of holiness, we would tell them that they had arrived. And that's just not true. I have grieved. I have prayed. I have struggled. I have sought because I see folks that have the Holy Ghost holding on to worldliness and putting paint where it don't belong and putting bottles and stuff where it don't belong and dressing ways they don't belong and I pray about it and I struggle with it and I'm upset about it and I don't understand why they're not growing up in their understanding and lighting up with their creative order but now I know why they're not. Because if they did, we would make them think they were arrived. If they look Pentecostal, we would tell everybody they'd arrived. And that's not true. Because the right clothes and the right bath and the right lack of jewelry and the right lack of makeup and the right gender distinction does not make you in the promised land. And I ain't sorry. And if I stepped on your toes with either one of those things, we'll deal with it. You understand what I'm saying? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Does anybody, anybody got a problem with it? Huh? I mean, really, speak now forever, hold your peace, because it's the truth. Somebody can come in here and rank Stone cold stranger and look Pentecostal and sit on the front row and have the right calisthenics down yeah. and we will automatically assume they're just a perfect one God apostolic tongue talking holy road of born again heaven bound believer. Yeah. And we don't know them from Adam. Right. And I can tell you, I know all the rules. I know how to look holy. Act holy. I know what not to watch, and I know what not to say, and I know what not to listen to. Yeah. And I still ain't walking in the promised land. Is this uncomfortable? Huh? Good. It's the truth. It's the truth. I know. Katie never heard Brother Dane's word preached like this. <laughs> I'm going to send in my notes. The lifelong. Y'all understand what I just said? Yes. You think I, you think, let me tell you how many of visiting preachers that I have told. Now don't think we gone charismatic. Hadn't I, baby? Yes. Don't think I don't believe in holiness no more. Because we got a whole lot of people in all different stages of growth. I ain't saying that no more. I'm not apologizing no more because I know what God is doing. I know what God is doing. Let me tell you something. God has used people. I have seen God use people at the baby stage. They ain't even got the Marlboro washed out of their clothes real good. <laughs> Say, well, you're just making people think they don't have to change. If you think that, you've lost your ever-loving mind. Yeah. You want to know what I believe about holiness? Go back and watch my series on it. You want to know what I preach and teach about holiness? I don't believe your hiding needs to be sticking out or any of your other parts. I believe your dress needs to come down to your knees or below. I don't believe it needs to be so tight you see your drawers. I mean, I, I know people People go, Brother GL just don't believe like we used to believe. That's nonsense. But I feel 
feel something rising up in me right now. I believe men ought to look like men and women ought to look like women more today than I ever have in my entire life. The world is crying for holiness. They're begging for holiness. And they're going to get it at the river bend. It's the lifelong personal and communal mission to know Christ. To be remade in his nature and to be on his mission. But spiritual growth, spiritual formation, I'm going to come to a close and I'm just going to, we're going to be in this for a minute. So, yeah, I'm about to wind it up. I'm fixing to speak to something that's going on right now and it's got to stop. And it's in the series, but it's just on time in the series. Spiritual formation does growing as God wants you to grow does not pursue the goal of greater status in the church. If that's what growth looks like to you, you've got the wrong idea of it. Gaining rank or status deforms rather than transforms and leads to competition and isolationism, which is antichrist at work in that it fosters division rather than unity and tearing down rather than edifying. And the enemy is at work in this area, in this church, right now. Yes, that's right. I feel it, I see it, and it's got to stop. Measuring yourself among yourself is unwise. Because right. you don't know where somebody else is. That's right. You don't know how me and the Lord talk in prayer about whether you need to be somewhere yet or whether you don't. There's not enough devils in hell to stop you from being elevated as long as you've been humbled under the hand of God like you're supposed to be. You will not arrive because you pass up somebody else. That is not the measure of growth. You will not arrive because you get a position behind your name. That is not a measure of growth. The only measure of growth that matters is how much fruit you brought from the harvest. Matter of fact, a lack of fruitfulness can get us unappointed just as fast as potential got us appointed. Y'all stand with me. <laughs> now, it's here. That same spirit's here. Jerry Clyde did not know he was adding so much to my ministry with the King Hunt story. I almost said it while I go, then Brother Shannon just said it. Knock him out, John. <laughs> and John Eubank said, just shoot up in here amongst us. Because one of us has got to have some relief. I tell you what I'm going to do, baby. I'm going to Casey's, and I'm going to drown my sorrows in two pieces of pepperoni pizza <laughs> and a 20-ounce root beer. The only thing is, Brother Christian, I'm not sorry. This is just not fun. This is not fun. I would really like, to, you know, Miss, Miss Jane taught me something when I first started meeting with her. I would really like for everybody just to stand around and join hands and let's all start singing Kumbaya. You baptize her. I want us to pray. Lindsay's about to get baptized. I saw, I saw the Lord moving on Lindsay. I saw the Lord moving on Lindsay at the mission. Yes. I hope it's still hot. I turned it on two times today. Uh, if it ain't, don't, don't let her know no different. Just sock her. In. <laughs> Lord Jesus, 
You're working. Of that there's no doubt. I pray that there's some honest hearted people under the sound of my voice. That they will go home and they won't get caught up in getting clothes ready for school tomorrow and get things ready for work tomorrow. And that they won't get caught up in, in make. I know sometimes I say stupid things, Lord. And sometimes my tongue gets tangled up. And, and I know sometimes that, that, it, that, that you have to take all what I said and kind of make it make more sense. But you know I love this church. You know I love this people. And I, I dream of the day when some little quiet sister who's never really done much comes up with their neighbor that they've won to the Lord. And they start putting this into practice. And they believe, God, they believe that they were created with purpose. And they believe that they were created for this moment, for this time, and that you will empower them to be a witness to a lost and dying world that's, that's inundated with ungodliness and immorality and, and just crazy stuff that they're inundated with on the news and on social media and at school. And, and they know it's not right. And they're looking for an anchor. They're looking for, they're looking for something you can grab a hold of that's solid. And it's, it's the same. And, and what we have is the same as it's been since the day of Pentecost. It's, it's the same. It's, it's the promises to you and to your children and all and that are far off, far off. The purple hair girls and, and the green hair girls and, and the guys that's, that thinks they're a girl. They're coming, Lord. We've got to be ready for them. And we've got to love them. We've got to love them with the love of God. We've got to be ready, Lord. I pray that some good-hearted soul will begin to pray today. Lord, help me be ready to teach a Bible study to transgender people. Help me to teach a Bible study to, to homosexual couples. And help me to, to be bold and courageous and to go in the love of God and the power of the Holy Ghost and fulfill my created purpose. And, and other people may not understand when I go to a bad part of town. And other people may not understand when I invite people to my home that got problems and they don't smell good. Oh, God, the world is lost, and you died for them, and you put us in this world, Lord, to reach them. You put us in this world to love them like you love them. Help them to believe, God, that the Holy Ghost is in them, not just to take them to heaven, but to take as many with them as they can possibly take. Let us speak our shoto, koto, shoto, roko, shatapa. Let us lift up our heads, Lord, and look at the fields are white. They're white for the harvest. It's not yet four months, but it's now. It's now. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for the power that you're, that you're, rising up. There's some people that it's rising up in and they're just silly enough to believe that the word is true and, and that there's more to life than just existing. There's more to life than just struggling to survive. But there's, there's a fulfillment to walk in. Oh, there's a mountain in the promised land that's mine. And I got a glimpse of it a long time ago. Oh, and I walk the mountain. Up. I won't stop. I'm just as able today and God help his people, his precious and anointed, powerful, full of potential people. Let them see what the Lord can do, what the Lord can do. Let's let the Holy Ghost work in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Is she ready? All right, come here and help me, wild man, one of y'all. Help me. Some of us can come up here and look, but make sure we don't crowd up the front because everybody needs to see. Everybody needs to see. Celebrate what God's doing in Lindsay's life. I saw the spirit moving on you, girl. You're going to be fine. Amen. You're going to be fine. We baptized John Sales. Come on, come on. Up there, we baptized you. Lindsay, 
is the power of the Holy Ghost affected her. And there's nothing more precious um, that I've ever seen in my entire life is to watch her, um, the Holy Ghost, begin to work on her. And tears just started flowing from her eyes. And, and God, God touched her. And, you know, she's heard the Word. She studied the Word. And now she's obeying the Word tonight by getting baptized. And uh, let's pray for Lindsay. God's doing a big thing in her life. Um, let's pray for her right now. Yes, Lord. Lindsay, in the name of Jesus, God, we pray, we pray over you right now. God's working in your life. God, we know that he's got big things and plans for you. God, we pray that, that uh, you guide her life and that everything she does, that you're a part of it. We pray this in your precious name, Jesus. Yes. Amen. Amen. By the confession of your faith and the teaching of the apostles, we now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. Thank you.